So Acts chapter 4, verses 5 to 12 says this. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Anas, Annas, uh, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Wow. You know, this was the first trial of the new Christian. Uh, the the way they called themselves in the beginning, right? Um, they they didn't see themselves as separate from, but a part of the faith. They they didn't see themselves separate from the Jewish culture and faith. They were just a reformation of it, but they were being expelled. And while the high priest and the Sadducees looked on at them with fear and continued to persecute, this is the beginning of the persecution promised to them by Jesus. And what a testimony they get to have, right? In fact, in this moment, we see them in front of a, a list of who's who in that day. Now, we don't know that the whole Sanhedrin was there, which was 70 members, but we see this list of names. Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the current and the official high priest of that day. He was the one the Romans had put in place. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's um, Annas. Um, and Annas was actually his father-in-law. Annas had been the high priest, but had been removed by the Romans in AD 15. So here, 15 years earlier or so, he had been removed, but yet still held the highest priority. He's listed first. Uh, you know, he's given deference in, in this to be actually in this council, right? He's still kind of seen is the ex officio leader because, well, the um, his son-in-law is the one who's in charge, but, you know, he's in charge of his son-in-law. That was kind of the way it was seen. And then we see this uh, these other additional names, right? They were um, John. John is mentioned here, and this was the son of Annas. So his son-in-law's in charge. His son's one of the high-ruling people. And then Alexander. Well, who's Alexander? Well, Alexander, we find out through history, was the brother of Philo. Now, you may not know that name, but if you're a church historian or a reader of, of this time frame, um, Josephus, Philo, um, you know, those are all Erasmus. Uh, those are all some big names of people who wrote. Uh, Philo was a philosopher, a Greco-Jewish philosopher. And was one of the richest men of his days, as was his brother. So here are this who's who's list, and they get to speak in front of them. And under Rome, there were, so the Sanhedrin has come together, maybe. There were 70 people in a Sanhedrin. And under Rome, Rome uh, appointed 11 different Sanhedrins. Okay, is that important? Well, it's something you need to know. So the Sanhedrin of Jerusalem was kind of the biggest one. They were the most well-known. They were the ones that all the other ones kind of gave deference to. But there were 11 others in these Roman uh, provincials that they were um, set up by the Roman Empire to do certain things. They were to deal with Jewish civil and criminal cases. And the Roman government would then appoint these leaders. So here's the thing to kind of think about. This is the ruling class of the church appointed by a secular government. That was the separation of church and state that the early um, fathers in America were trying to get away from. Good morning, Estella. Because in that European English nation, the rulers, the Archbishop of Canterbury was appointed by the king and queen. They were ruled by the king and queen. And I mean, that was 
one of the biggest messes in history was when one of them who was appointed, who really wanted nothing to do with the church, he was not a religious individual, but he turned religious and started to go against the king. Uh, great English history we won't get into there. But they were appointed. But it wouldn't last long. They were trying to hold on to their power. And it wouldn't last long. In AD 70, with the destruction of Jerusalem, they would destroy and eliminate all of these Sanhedrins and the rulings. And Rome said, no longer will you be able to rule your own people. We will rule you. And they took over completely. They asked by whose power and authority. This is a similar question to what Jesus was asked by this very same group. In Matthew 21, 23, or in Luke 11, 14, 23, we see it uh, listed out for us. Good morning, mom and dad. But there's some underlining to it. They're implying that there is some illegal acts taking place here. And they're seeking to trip them up as the Sanhedrin claims exclusive rights to healers and teachers and appointing them. And so who gave you authority? They're waiting on them to say something else. The second implied uh, act and accusation here is the fact to magical properties, magical practices, which were punishable by death if the Romans would agree to it, right? They, they had no right to kill on their own. They had to get the Romans to actually um, execute that final judgment. That's why they took Jesus to Pilate, right? But those were the two accusations that if they could get them to say that they were preaching by an authority other than the Sanhedrin, well, then that was illegal. And then if they were to admit to having done magical acts on their own and taking claim for it, well, we healed that man, you know, then they could have been punishable by death. And hey, there's a great way to get rid of them. They sought to trip them up because they considered them unschooled fishermen. <laughs> Who are these unschooled Galileans, right? And instead, they find themselves schooled by the unschooled. Peter and John had to be worried. How could they expect? How, how could they expect justice from the same individuals who had just recently executed, tried and had executed Jesus? They had unlawfully judged him. They had unlawfully and unjustly tried him. They probably expected to have the same fate. But then by the Holy Spirit, Peter once again spoke up. Peter, who cringed before a maid's question and denied Jesus, right? He was hiding from a, a little servant girl. Now he boldly, for the third time, stands up by the Holy Spirit and starts proclaiming things, filled with God's Holy Spirit, and he boldly proclaims Christ. He boldly speaks the name of Jesus. You see, really, the big, big key point for us as believers as we read this is, well, Jesus changes everything. Jesus and his Holy Spirit changes us. When we say we want to be disciples and we don't know how to go out, we don't know how to share our faith, well, guess what? Pray. Because the Holy Spirit changes everything. He will give you the boldness to proclaim his name and the grace and the mercy and the love by which to do it. Pentecost, Bud Ben says, Pentecost makes cowards, uh, cor uh, makes courageous men out of cowards. Let me start over. Pentecost makes courageous men out of cowards and witnesses out of moral weaklings. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So Peter stands up and he begins to make a defense in four different ways. First, he says the miracles benefited the crippled man. They were a good deed done. How can you speak about, against something that has done good deeds? Now, we have a culture that tries to say, well, if I just do good things and it's all okay. Well, he starts with that because that's where this culture was too. If it was good, how can you speak against that? Obviously, it wasn't of the devil if it was good, if it benefited this man. But he doesn't stop there, which the world does. He goes on and says, and it happened in Jesus' name. Jesus of Nazareth, of whom you crucified. His presence uh, gave testimony to the truth. Jesus' presence in the miracle gave testimony to the truth that what he said was true. He was truly the Son of God. God had outwitted the rulers of the Jews is a third thing. Those who sought to, uh, to silence Jesus in death, yet, oh, no, 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 he gained victory in the resurrection, which they said they didn't agree could happen, but it did. And they were still fighting and denying it. And the power of God shone evil.
and brighter by that death and resurrection. He was the stone the builders rejected. We're going to talk more about that because that's important. Do that tomorrow uh, or on Monday. You know, there is no name greater than Jesus Christ. It, it is not only the one that heals. This is the fourth thing. No name greater than Jesus Christ. It is not only the one that heals, but it is also the one that, uh, by the name of Jesus, that saves souls. And they were proclaiming this name. He was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He is victorious. Peter boldly and clearly said, there is no other way to God but by Jesus. Clearly. We would believe that today. The world, though, goes around with this same argument going on. Oh, there's other ways. There's other ways. You know, if you're just a good person. You know, if you think happy thoughts. Oh, if you click your heels together with red shoes. I, saying there's no place like heaven. I, you know, the world is full of, and those are kind of dumb examples, but we do. We seek it. We seek to fill the God-sized hole with people. Lust, addictions. We seek to fill the God side hole with uh, Eastern meditations, transcendentalism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness. I mean, all sorts of other belief systems which do not truly rely on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yeah. John 14, exactly 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. No man, right? Jesus said it. We believe it. He is the only way. But, you know, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, were stuck on the fact that Yahweh was one God, which he was. And they missed that Jesus Christ was Yahweh, the very Son of God the very being of God. And the Holy Spirit was that being, that Trinity, that great Trinity that we talk about. There is no way to heaven but by Jesus. And the other thing that the apostles were proclaiming in that moment, and this was the most seditious of all their statements, and they were saying to the Sanhedrin, and we, not you, are on God's side. Now, that is something we have to be careful when we say. That has had to be something that, is, as uh, some great preachers have said, that we preach sin with tears in our eyes. We don't haughtily stand up and proudfully go, you're on the wrong side, you're going to hell. No, but with tears in our eyes, with love and compassion and mercy and grace, we preach the good news of Jesus Christ, that there is hope, because that's what we see. That's what we see, that even through the apostles, they were calling all to come to Jesus. That was that sermon at Pentecost. These Jews, those that had been a part of yelling crucify, and Peter stood up and said, but there is hope even for you who denied Jesus. Come to him. Come. Come home, right? All who are weary, come home. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Right, All of those, those great words that we have sung, that even the most wayward sinner can find grace and mercy and love in Jesus. That's the good news. It's the good news that lies within each and every single one of us. That no matter what, someone around us has done, no matter the deeds they have done, no matter the hurt, the harm, the sin, the arrogance, the addictions, our God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All sin. All. All means all. So, which side are we on? Are we like the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, picking at little things? Do we walk up to somebody and with a haughtiness go, you're going to hell? Do we, by our actions and attitudes? You know, we, we talked in our group last night on Wednesday night that 
um, it's easy to shine God's love to people that we like. It's easy to shine God's love to people who like us. But to pray for those who persecute you. To shine God's love to people who don't want it. To turn the other cheek. Hmm. To forgive those that hurt us. So that the good news of Jesus Christ might be proclaimed. That is the hardest thing to do as a believer. And often that is why we isolate and don't share the love of Jesus Christ with all that we meet. So, if you haven't got my challenge day in and day out, who are you proclaiming Jesus to? Who are you praying for each and every day? Lifting up to God and saying, Lord, I may not be able to speak into this, but you can. Who are you, well, setting the hounds of heaven on. That was the way one um, theologian put it years and years ago. The hounds of heaven. Man. But those hounds don't tear it apart. Those hounds seek after so as to bring to safety. Hmm. Who are you a part of bringing home? You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You have been given the gifts. If you remain in him as he remains in you, right? That's the great John 15. Are you, for the glory of God the Father, being disciples who seek to go out and share the love of Jesus with all that we meet? Some plant, some water, some get to reap that harvest and actually get to help someone come to know the Lord. But we have a world that's hungry. We have a world that's hurting. And you, oh believer, you, and I'm looking at myself too. We have within us the hope of Jesus Christ which the drowning world is looking for. That hand of Jesus that reached out when Peter had reached that moment where the water is capsizing over his head and he's about to drown and reaches out to save him. We get to be that hand of Jesus, pulling them up into Jesus' embrace. Will you join and be a part of the kingdom of God in this mission? Not to hack people to pieces, but to be healers. In the name of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, send us out. May we understand our position as missionaries to our village. Missionaries to our neighbors. Missionaries to our workplaces. Use us, we pray. Help us to point people to you. For your kingdom's sake, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, go in peace, and I pray you have a great rest of the afternoon.